Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where I recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 22nd of June, 2021. All right, everyone. Uh, I've had a few people kind of ask me to make some comments on the market or kind of give my a general feel for where we are right now in the market. And I'm going to be honest, like I have no special knowledge here, right? I've said, you know, a lot of times on the refuel that uh, short term, I have absolutely no idea where the market is going. It can go lower than you expect. It can, you know, bounce. It can do this. It can do that. And right now, as you can see on my screen, you know, it's below 1800 uh, ETH and, you know, I think BTC was, it got below 30K and, you know, it's very volatile out there. Gas prices have spiked, uh, you know, there's just so much kind of like happening right now that if you've been here before during these kind of like brutal dumps, which, you know, these are, these are pretty much reminding me of like 2018 and 2019. You, you, you'll have seen this all before and they don't last forever. You know, it might seem like the price is just going to keep dropping forever, but eventually buyers step in. Um, but, you know, who knows if it's going to be short or long term here. I think the consensus really right now is that most likely in like a longer kind of term bear market, you know, I don't think anyone, I, I, I haven't actually seen anyone that thinks it's going to last two years again, like it did in 2018 and 2019. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think most people believe there's a higher chance to be going to like a longer term bear market than, you know, something kind of more, I guess, uh, short, short term here. Now, for me personally, I mean, as being a long-term guy, like I don't really care too much. I mean, I said countless times I haven't sold any of my ETH. It's pretty much most of it is in is in staking, and I'm happy just leaving it there. Uh, you know, earning me more ETH as as time goes on here. Um, but ge ge generally, you know, if you are over invested in the market, these these moves can feel really bad. And I mean, not even just being over invested, it can it can feel really really terrible watching your portfolio just evaporate, you know, in front of your eyes. And I think that the reason why markets uh, can go down, you know, faster than they can go up is because the the fear, is, you know, is more powerful than the greed. And I've written about this before on the newsletter, where the you know the emo you know, just just. You know, just anecdotally, when you're kind of looking at the chart yourself or looking at the price yourself, when it's going up, you know, yes, you feel like uh, really happy and, you you know, you might get some greed and you might be feeling kind of euphoric here. But, but you know, when it's going down, that fear, that fear that really grips you is much worse, I believe, uh, at least in my experience, than than the, than the greed. Uh, and, you know, if you haven't kind of like taken any profits and if you you just uh, basically kept riding it up and whatever and, and, and you didn't take any profits and that could feel even worse. And it depends on like what your style is. I know there's a lot of people out there who took some profits but kept most of their ETH that I know. Um, there are some people out there that took nothing thing and kept all of their ETH. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm included in that, but it really does depend on your personal situation and where you're sitting. Like if you're just working a kind of like a normal job, whether that's inside crypto or outside of crypto and you're fine, you have a salary coming your way and everything like that, then I, I don't think that you really have anything to kind of worry about because, you know, you're not relying on crypto to, to get you by. But if you're someone who like quit their job because you had like all these crypto riches, but you never cashed it out, then yeah, of course, you're going to, you're going to feel shit about it. You're going to be worrying about it. So, I mean, I totally get that. But at the same time, it's just like an individual situation, an individual choice you have to make. You have to basically come to terms with the fact that the market is not always going to do what you want it to do. Um, and, you know, most of the time, it's not going to do what you want it to do on both the way up and the way down. Like on the way up, you might be thinking, oh, you know, I'll, I'll cash out this arbitrary number because it's like uh, I'll have this much money if I do that. And then, you know, the market might go down from there. And then you'll be like, okay, it's just going to go back up. It's fine. And I think that's the mentality that a lot of new people get into is where, the people over, I guess, like from from basically March of last year until uh, I guess uh, what was it like last month? Pretty much like ETH was up only mode, right? Like we had dips and all that sort of stuff, but for the majority of the time it was up only mode, and the dips weren't weren't um, as as harsh as this or anything like that. So all of those people that entered the market then have never experienced this sort of market action. And I'm sure there's a, there's some among you as well that have never experienced this. So they can be even scarier. And that's why the, you know, we can, you can get stuck in sideways slash bear markets for, for a long time, because it, it's just the same reflex reflexivity that you see on the way up. Like the, if you count the um, bull market as starting at like the bottom, so March, 2020, then we had like a, a longer than a year bull market. And if you count the bear market as like, the all-time high top and then you know, uh, not getting back to all until we get back to all time high, that's the bear market, then, you know, the bear market can last a year or longer than a year. It, and it lasted two, you know, two years last time. So 
and that's not to say that I, I, I'm saying that we're going to go into a long-term bear market or anything like that. As I said, I have no idea. But you need to be prepared for every scenario. You can't, like, I mean, and, and, and none, of, none of this that I say is investment advice, but you can't just always think, you know, it's going to go up forever. I mean, I know I've given some really ridiculous price targets before on the refuel, um, you know, like saying 100K. But I said that I thought that would take decades to, to play out, if it ever plays out. And that's my bet that I'm taking. I never said it was going to happen, like, next month or even next year or anything like that because that's just not how markets work like it's it's not going to 100k in 2 years because that would mean okay to give some context here about what this means Gen generally, the way I look at the markets is okay. How how much is the is everyone in profit by? Because when it gets to a certain point, you have like way too many people sitting on way too many profits, and those people inevitably want to take those profits. So um, there's an indicator that I that I use called um, the Nupple indicator, and I've gone over this on the data pump a lot. But essentially, that shows you uh, how much how many people are in uh, I guess like uh, in an asset are in profit by how much. Now, if you think about it, like even people that bought at like $300 are still in pretty good profits right now, pretty healthy profits at, at this point. Um, and gen generally, I think like a 5 to 10x on one of these bigger assets like BTC or ETH is is something that like a lot of people are going to start cashing out on. Not, you know, even the newer people that are in a 5 to 10x in less than a year, like, um, come on. Like, I mean, ETH went 44x from the March 2020 bottom to the top. Like, that's that's insane. Now, now obviously, most people didn't buy them. I would actually wager that most people bought uh, maybe between... Uh, maybe over a thousand dollars, actually, I would say. Um, and you know, and the people that bought between five hundred and a thousand dollars, a lot of them probably were cashing out at three k plus because they'd already made like six x their money in a very very short amount of time. Like if you had bought at uh, at five hundred, uh, I think ETH was still five hundred in like December or something like that. And you know, you saw forty four hundred in May. I mean, that's like five months, right, or six months or something like that. You had made a very very healthy profit, six x your money in in six months. And no other market on the planet is giving you that. Uh, unless you're kind of like gambling, like buying ETH to me is is not gambling. It's you're actually investing in a technology. You know, the other kind of like assets that would have given you that with something like GME or AMC or whatever, but they're meme stocks. And like th that, that to me was just gambling. So I think when you, th when you kind of think about that and you think about the absolutely insane profits that a lot of people have made, and I've made the point before that there's never enough liquidity to cover everyone's kind of like uh, profits. So if everyone starts selling at the same time and then like the new money stops coming in, then we just end up going, you know, going down and we just keep going down and it takes a, a while to get back up to, to that old time high. So We'll see how it plays out from here. I have absolutely no idea what's going to happen in the short to medium term, but obviously I'm still very bullish. I'm not going anywhere. I'm already making plans for what I'm going to be doing uh, if you know the market goes into a prolonged, prolonged kind of like sideways bear market uh, because I'll have a lot less distractions. Like believe it or not, even though I don't trade, the the price action, the charts, the the, the mania of the bull market still uh, distracts me a lot, and uh, it, it's kind of hard to focus. But in in the kind of like a bear or sideways market is where you can get a lot of a lot more stuff done. So I'm already making tons of plans there. We'll have more to, to kind of talk about there soon because um, a lot of it's got to do with the daily way. But you go, I think it goes without saying that I'll keep doing these refuels. Of course, like nothing changes on that front. Obviously, still be in the Discord. Um, you know, we're having a bit of fun in the Discord right now on the prices channel. There's a lot of memes going on. There's this guy called Aaron who's calling for an $1,100 ETH and then to, for ETH to go to 10k and then ETH to go to 300 in a couple of years or something. And you know, it's become a bit of a meme, bit of a bit of a fun there. And I and I think I've. I've always said that I believe bear market memes are just so much better than bull market memes because shared pain or shared cope is better than like shared euphoria, I think. Um, so yeah, I mean, just, just hop into the Discord channel if you haven't yet. The link is in the YouTube description. But I think that's that's kind of all I have to say about the market for now. I mean, I went over the state of the market on on, on Friday's refuel last week. So I don't have much more to say there. And, and going forward, I mean, I'm not going to comment on the market too much unless something ridiculous happens like ETH goes below 1K or something like that. That, like in one candle or whatever. Just generally, this this um, channel and like what I do on the refuel is not really meant to be focused on price or whatever. It's meant to be focused on the long term kind of like fundamentals and health of Ethereum and all the projects within it. And just because I think that's more fun to focus on. The price is going to do whatever the price is going to do. If you're a trader, then of course you care about the price. But at the same time, like if you're a trader, you shouldn't be watching the refuel for trading uh, kind of like um, commentary. There's plenty of other channels out there for that. But anyway, I'm going to leave it at that for today. Uh, I hope you're all kind of like staying safe in these markets. And 
the only piece of advice that I would give you, and this is an investment advice, this is just general advice, just survive. That is all you need to do in these markets. You just survive. Don't get blown up on leverage. Don't panic sell into things. If you don't, like if you don't need the money for anything, don't panic sell. Like that that's generally my rule with things. It's like unless you actually need the money to live or to pay bills or whatever, then panic selling into kind of like these dumps is just gonna end up getting you wrecked. And 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 yeah. But anyway, I'm gonna leave it at that. Moving on to the project updates. Uh, so Eleonora from uh, in the Discord chat uh, pointed out that uh, Alchemix is kind of like um, an initiative here to basically collect uh, the funds that were lost in the recent exploit. He's going really well. So you can see here, this is the return funds dashboard, and they've already collected over 1,000 of the 2,200 uh, ETH that is owed to the protocol, which is really, really cool. So, I mean, just a quick recap here. The, re the reason that... Um, uh, this exploit, uh, I, sorry, what happened with this exploit was that uh, essentially people could kind of like get their ETH collateral out without uh, burning their, uh, their AL ETH for it, I believe. Um, and, you know, those people uh, received the bonus amount of ETH. So now they, they can basically just return that ETH to, to the protocol here, which is, you know, it's really cool to see that. Uh, you can see that over a thousand ETH is already being given back, which means that over a thousand ETH worth, I don't know how many individual people that is, but like this, the, the, these people are honest, which is really cool. Now you can see here, my account wasn't involved in the incident because unfortunately I wasn't able to mint any AL ETH before the incident happened, or maybe fortunately because I wasn't involved in the, in the kind of exploit here, but no one lost any money here. It was the protocol that lost the money. But anyway, really cool to see this. If you were involved in this and you do have some of that bonus ETH that you need to give back, I mean, do consider giving it back. Like You're not ob obligated to, like no one's forcing you to do it, but do consider giving it back because, uh, you know, making uh, Alchemix whole as a protocol and making it healthier as a protocol, uh, I, I believe is the way to go. So yeah, really cool to see this. Hopefully we get up to 2200 ETH sooner rather than later. So Zach from Coinbase posted a tweet today that USDC has just reached a $25 billion market cap. Now, I wrote the Daily Gray newsletter today about the, about stablecoins, basically. And, and in it, I was talking about how USDC, uh, USDT, sorry, and Tether's dominance has actually been going down over time. Because I know there's a lot of concerns about Tether. Um, there's a lot of kind of like, I guess, um, uh, FUD around it. There's a lot of uh, people saying, you know, Tether's unbacked. And when it blows up, it's going to take the whole crypto market with it. I mean, this kind of stuff has been around since kind of like Tether existed. And also this stuff tends to rear its head during bear markets. I don't know if it's coordinated FUD from people that want to buy in cheaper. I don't know what it is. It just seems very odd that this happens whenever the market's going down. I guess people just want to look for someone to blame or whatever, um, or something to blame or a structural issue, whatever it is. Um, but gen ge generally, I, I, I just like don't kind of listen to that sort of stuff. Like USDT is is what it is. If we want to actually um, get off dependence on USD USDT or Tether, um, and then we should be kind of focusing on other stable coins. So that's what exactly what's happening. USDC is growing. Uh, DAI is growing. BUSD. I mean, there's a bunch of others out there. LUSD. There's so many of uh, stable coins now. Uh, and, and they're growing and they're taking market share away from, from Tether, which is which is positive because we don't want, you know, just one stable coin being um, the king here. But in saying that, we also don't want one centralized stable coin being the king. Now, USDC, yeah, it's better than Tether, but it's still centralized, right? It's hundred percent centralized. It's just a different kind of um, a, a different kind of king here, right? Uh, whereas like it's, it's Coinbase instead of uh, Bitfinex, for example. So I, I I mostly try to focus on the growth of like the decentralized stable coins, but that's pretty hard these days as well because Dai is like fifty percent backed by USDC, um, and like the algorithmic stable coins have pretty much all blown up spectacularly there's only like a couple out there that are still okay uh, but even they have like some centralization vectors and things like that and one thing that's actually not technically a stable coin because it's not pegged to a dollar uh, and it's not pegged to any fiat currency is rye uh, and that actually has been holding its stability quite well around three dollars but it's pegged to itself um if you want to learn more about rye it's actually a good bankless podcast about it um i won't i won't kind of describe how it works on the refuel but essentially that has been holding um it's kind of like pegged to itself quite well but anyway, I think that the, the the longer like I guess like time goes on, the more of this kind of like decentralization of stablecoin dominance we're going to be seeing. I think uh, you know Tether is still like very dominant in terms of trading volumes, though, which is something I discovered while doing some research for the newsletter. Where Tether's twenty four hour trading volume over the last uh, twenty four hours, sorry, is at uh, twenty five billion dollars, whereas USDT is only I think two point five billion, and BUSD, which is Binance's stablecoin, is only about six billion. So you can see that Tether's dominance is 
absolutely insane. Um, and, you know, Tether is obviously supported on pretty much every major exchange you can think of. It is used and favored by a lot of the big traders out there, a lot of the whales out there. It has extremely deep liquidity um, and, and, and obviously a very high market cap at about $70 billion at, at this at time of recording. So I think that those network effects can't be understated. Um, you, you know, you, uh, you can't basically say that, you know, these other stable coins are going to just eat Tether's lunch because there's risks associated with it. No, liquidity begets liquidity in a lot of these systems. So for Tether to be dethroned from its kind of like trading volume mantle, uh, it's going to take a long time. I actually think it's going to take a much longer than people think it will. And in that time, you know, Tether's just going to be growing its network effects. You know, Tether's not slowing down it's it has it's not going anywhere unless you know the the critics are right and that tether is actually not backed by anything right um and you know it has all the shadiness behind it and whatever i'm not going to comment on that but if they are right then yeah that's probably structurally bad for crypto but it'll be less bad if we have these alternatives available at the time because that means people could go from tether into these alternatives and we wouldn't have like you know as bad of a, of a crash if you kind of think about it that way but still uh, look, I'm going to keep an eye on this. You know, we can read the newsletter for some more uh, kind of info about this, but it's still good to see that USDC is growing. Um, you know, I, I hope to see kind of like stable coins, uh, I guess, like decentralized, at least market share over time. Obviously, USDC and Tether and BUSD, all that are never going to be decentralized stable coins, but at least we're not going to have like this single point of failure with Tether going forward. So uh, Tim Biker put out a, a reminder that the Robson fork for London is this week. I mean, I spoke about this on yesterday's refuel. There's actually an ETA kind of countdown here on Etherscan. You can see that at a time of recording, it's happening in one day and 16 hours. Now, obviously, this is just a test net, not the main net. So this may not be interesting to you. But I think that focusing on this sort of stuff is, is obviously positive because, as I said yesterday, if the test nets go well, then the main net date it will be uh, late July, early August. If there are hiccups on test nets if there are bugs then 1559 is definitely not happening uh in late july early august because you know they'll have to fix the bugs and then we'll have to redeploy to the test net and everything like that at this point in time i don't think it really matters if you were relying on 1559 to be like a massive price driver i mean maybe it was in terms of its narrative maybe that is a big part of why ETH went to 4400 but i you know I don't think that 1559 is going to be a buy the news event or sell the news event or anything like that. I just think it's just another protocol upgrade that goes into Ethereum that's just going to be there, you know, in perpetuity. It's not going to, uh, you know, Ethereum doesn't cater for bull or bear markets. It caters for all markets. And, you know, if, if we do have another year bear market, I think I discussed this on yesterday's refuel, but if we do have another year uh, bear market from here, then in a year's time, Ethereum is going to look amazing, right? Like 1559, the merge done. We're going to have layer 2s like pretty much roll out. We're going to have DeFi continuing to grow. Lots of new DeFi apps that we couldn't even think of at this point in time. So yeah, I guess like uh, we'll see what happens around 1559. Uh, still, you know, the funny thing is about the market is that we're at 1800 right now or below that or whatever the price of ETH is. But next month, we could easily be at 3K plus if for some reason the market's feeling bullish again. So who knows? Who knows what the price is going to be? Maybe the price will be 1559. When my, you know, that's a meme that I've, been, uh, that I've seen kind of like playing around there. I really don't know. Who knows? But yeah, still good to keep an eye on this. Uh, and I'll definitely be keeping you updated on the refuel for sure. So Muhammad, uh, and I, I kind of spoke about Muhammad the other day. They, uh, he, him and his team kind of like be, uh, built a web page called watchtheburn.com, which is basically a way to watch ETH being burned on uh, the test net. So it's currently monitoring the Cavalero test net, I believe, or something like that. Um, and, you know, that's one of the smaller test nets that's, that's happening right now. And I, I'm sure it's going to switch over to, you know, Ropsten or Rinkaby or whatever test nets when that comes uh, comes along. Okay, the test net's called Calaveras here, and that's DevNet. So, and then I'm sure this is going to kind of like change over to mainnet once that's deployed, which is really cool because you can see on a per block basis how much ETH is being burned here. Obviously, being a dev net, there's not much activity happening, but this is going to be really, really awesome to refer to. I think it's going to be one of the most popular websites when 1559 is deployed to mainnet because it'd be an easy way for people to kind of look at what's being burned, take screenshots, share it to Twitter, and just like get something for the community to kind of rally behind. So, yeah, I'm really glad this exists. I mean, I think I mentioned on the review a few weeks ago that I expected tools like this to, to go live very soon because we were approaching 1559 and it's, they're just like very, very popular, right? Um, because of the fact that we're going to be burning ETH here. So looking forward to seeing this uh, be pointed at the other test nets when they go live and, and the main net, obviously, when that goes live, hopefully sooner rather than later. 
So quick reminder here, there is a Ethereum Foundation Research Team AMA happening at, on June 23rd at 1 p.m. UTC, which is in 24 hours from time of recording. Um, for, you know, by the time you watch it, it could be much less than that. So I don't know what time 1, 1 p.m. US, UTC is. Actually, no, I do know what it is in my time. It's 11 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Now, if I'm uh, remembering correctly, because that's when I do the AMA, my AMAs, um, uh, 11 p.m. Uh, my time is 6 a.m. Pacific. Uh, standard time, so uh, West Coast US, 9 a.m. East Coast, and I think sometime in the afternoon for uh, my friends in Europe. So, yeah, and then Asia, I think, would be like maybe around 11, around kind of this time, like late night as well. So, if you're available, then definitely go check out this AMA. Uh, I will be uh, putting together on the refuel a recap of the AMA in terms of like the most interesting questions and answers on there, but these AMAs are always really good, and there's a lot of meat in them too. So, yeah, definitely uh, get ready for this. There'll be links in the YouTube description to go ask your questions before the AMA happens, but I'm sure there's going to be a lot of stuff in there from the EF research team to get excited about uh, and to keep us going in, in this kind of like down market here. Because, I mean, there's always so much exciting stuff happening in Ethereum, right? Like, the, you, you can't be bored. Even when the market is quiet, you cannot be bored in Ethereum. <laughs> So Starkware announced today that they're building a uh, new Starkware, a uh, Starknet full node called Fermion. And the, the core team that's building this uh, is Alexei uh, Sharp uh, from uh, uh, Ma Mandagaran, uh, sorry, Igor, sorry, I should say, uh, uh, from Aragon. So Aragon was Turbo Geth. I've, I've, I've spoken about Aragon before. So it seems that these two two guys here are going to be building both Aragon and Starknet's full node as well. So uh, it's really, really cool to see this. And they're, they're hiring as well. So you should reach out if you think that um, ZK Rollup full nodes are cooler than flying cars. Um, and this is really cool to see that uh, I think, um, you know, more of the Ethereum layer one, you know, core protocol de uh, researchers and developers are getting the chance to build layer two kind of things here like full nodes and stuff like that because you know it's it's funny because people go um it talks a lot a lot of the time people talk about you know how do, how are core devs going to get funded um you know are they just going to get funded by the ethereum foundation or are there other pl places that are going to fund them so typically it's been there's standalone companies like prism and lighthouse um sorry not lighthouse uh, sigma prime and a bunch of others out there. There's obviously been the Ethereum Foundation. There's been Consensus. There's been Gitcoin grants funding as well. There've been there's been Vitalik's airdrops back in the day. He airdropped a thousand ETH to some of the core ETH two teams. Um, and now we have uh, Starkware, one of the layer two teams, funding uh, their own kind of like full node here. But I'm sure that that money is going to go far to be able to allow Alexei and Igor to continue their work on Aragon. And actually, I should mention that Gnosis is also supporting Aragon here with funding, and they have also supported core development in the past. And I'm sure I'm forgetting some, but, you know, there's plenty of funding out there for core devs, which which I really, really love. And, you know, uh, I think it's just really positive that these developers are getting to do what they want to do, but also getting compensated for it. Uh, and, you know, it's just really cool to see them working on on this. And I'm looking forward to other layer two kind of like, uh, I guess, pr uh, protocols like Arbitrum and Optimism. Um, you know, of course, like uh, Polygon is get, is really involved there as well in kind of contributing to to kind of like, uh, you know, the, the core developers and, and getting them on board and, and paying them for their very valuable work here. So speaking of core development, uh, Nimbus has introduced uh, Fluffy, which is an ultra light client for Ethereum. So what this means is that low res uh, this is built for low resource devices, such as a mobile phones, Raspberry Pis, things like that. No syncing required, uh, built for massive sc scale and has a, j a native JSON RPC here. So this essentially means that you can have like a, a light client on your phone and you'll be able to kind of talk to the Ethereum network using this light client. Now, I don't know if this is for ETH1 and ETH2. I'm assuming it's going to be for, for kind of both here. Um, and, you know, you can see like it detailed in this blog post, it goes into a bit of a technical detail here. So if you want to read this, you can go check it out. But this is really cool to see that another kind of client is coming to Ethereum um, and it's an ultra light client, uh, ultra light client as well, because that's actually something that Ethereum has been missing or at least there hasn't been enough focus on in the past is that these like this light client ecosystem and the fact that that Nimbus is building this Nimbus is part of the status team is really cool because this is another team that's been funding Ethereum core development they've been building an ETH2 uh, uh, client called Nimbus um, as well which so it's really really cool to see them um, you know building a new one called Fluffy here. 
So I haven't spoken about Loopring too much lately, but they are still around and they are still doing massive scalability at layer two here. You should definitely go check them out if you haven't yet. When gas prices are actually calmed down again, which they will be soon once the market volatility dies down, it's the perfect opportunity to get on Loopring. So if the gas price is about 10 guay, then it's very cheap to get onto Loopring's layer two um, and do all your kind of like fast, cheap, and secure trading on there. And that, you know, doesn't just go for Loopring. It goes for like all of the layer twos out there on Ethereum, you know, you have to bridge in. So why not bridge in when gas prices are cheap? You know, this goes for everything like Polygon, Arbitrum, Optimism, Starkware's uh, ecosystem, Loopring, um, you know, Starkware's ecosystem includes DYDX, Diversify, Immutable X, uh, ZK Sync uh, for your Gitcoin grants, um, don donations, Her Hermes Network. Like there's so many layer two th yeah, things out there right now. And the best time to get onto them is when gas is cheap. And obviously there's going to be centralized exchanges supporting some of them. I've talked about how OKCoin okay and OKX support Polygon. OKX is also going to be supporting Arbitrum. Uh, I'm sure Coinbase is going to be adding support for these things soon. Uh, but generally, uh, you know, when gas is cheap, that's the best time to get on layer two. So yeah, go do that if you haven't yet. Um, maybe gas will be cheaper by the time you watch this because right now it's hovering at almost 200 guay, which means the market is quite volatile and people are doing arbitrage transaction transactions and trying to save their positions from liquidation and all that good stuff. But anyway, I'm going to leave it at that for today. So thank you again, everyone, for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give that video a thumbs up. Subscribe to the newsletter. Join the Discord channel. And I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.